are you all? There's plenty of cookies up here. There's still, there's still water, and if you're falling asleep, there's caffeine, caffeinated pot. In uh, uh, this morning, finishing again, and I and I I do appreciate that. While I get all excited about John, John literature, to really come to really come in con in in face to face with it for the first time, and you go, oh my God, this isn't at all what I thought it was. It can be a little disorienting, huh? So I I, I I kind of fear you feel disoriented. It's like, oh my gosh. Uh, but so here's a you got more questions, more venting. What do you want to? Anything you want to say about the Johannine tradition? I'd it, rather read Paul. <laughs> you'd rather read Paul? That says a lot. You'll get again. This is your first time dealing. The first time you deal with this stuff, it's like it just it's, it's like what? Oh, but again, like with Paul, the second time it gets a little. Get familiar with them. I mean, J John is beautiful, wonderful, and a little bit scary. All of that. It's all of that. Well, no, because it's not first person. It's it's you know the letters. Well, again, if we had more letters like Second and Third John, that'd be pretty tormented, if you ask me. And again, and you see, I, I said earlier when we read Paul, unity in the church has been the bugaboo from the beginning. Think about Paul. Paul was constantly pushing unity because that was their big problem. They didn't, and again, you know, when, by the way, I have, for show and tell, I have a collection of the Gnostic writings. Or, better yet, write, write down and Google Irenaeus. I R E N A E U S. The second century, he was uh, from the east, from like Smyrna, from modern day Turkey, but he moved to the west, to Lyon in France. And he wrote a book called Adversis Hero Against the Heretics. It's in five books, five big books, attacking Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a cultural view that it, it touched Judaism, it touched Christianity, it touched, it was kind of like a movement. And Irenaeus just, it just, oh, it just made him nuts. And so he was, he's not the first, but he is perhaps the earliest, most complete response from the church Catholic, from the great church, from the, the church of the synoptics. Huh? He wrote this book, and still, it's great reading. It's great reading. As he, now again, does he always tell us the truth about them? You know, it's hard to give your enemy, to be frank and honest about your enemy. You know, you always see them as the worst. So he may not be giving up, that's the problem. Most of the, most of the original Gnostic sources were suffocated. The church, over the centuries, kind of like burned them and didn't copy them, and so they, they've been lost to us. There's always Gnosticism. It always comes back, but, but not, it's not like a continuous thing like the church has been itself. Anyway, uh, in, the, in the 1940s uh, was discovered a collection uh, called Nag Hammadi. That's a city along the, along the Nile. And what was found in it was a jar stuffed with writings many of which are Gnostic. Not all of them were. Some are philosophical, but some were. Uh, and it, se it seems like it was somebody's library. Eventually, when Christianity became the legal religion, it really began to stomp on Gnosticism. And so, uh, when it had the authority figures, when it had the emperors on its side. And so, this was somebody's library that they hid, because they didn't want it to be destroyed. So, um, and then there, there are a few other Gnostic texts that have been discovered. Some of them make great writing, reading. Some of them are just crazy. Um, if you want, if, I'm gonna pass this around for show and tell. If you wanna read something very attractive, read the letter to Flora. Flora was a Roman Christian who got drawn in by the Gnostics. And, and the author writes just a very beautiful appeal to her. So again, 
Gnosticism is a modern, a 19th century term. They didn't call themselves, I mean, Irenaeus called them Gnostics, so-called Gnostics, but that wasn't their name for themselves, probably. And, um, but Irenaeus, very a churchman, very, and his response to the Gnostics was, what do we have that they don't have? Apostolic connections. We can claim people who knew Jesus. Second, the rule of faith. That is, the oral, remember in the, um, in the uh, historical, the, the Pontifical Biblical Commission's document on the historical truth of the Gospels, the, the rule of faith is just the story. It's the Christian story that predates any writing. So the rule of faith, the four Gospels, the four Gospels, the apostolic succession, and the Bishop of Rome. Those were his four responses to Gnosticism. This is how we stay on the straight and narrow. He accused them of just making stuff up. He said, like, if, if you go to, a, you, you, you go to a, a house on the floor, you see a mosaic floor, a lovely mosaic floor of the picture of Jesus. And you attack it with uh, knives, and you pull up the tessera, and then you make it into a dog. <laughs> you say, that's Jesus. That's what they do, he said. They make stuff up. So Irenaeus was very bright, and, and he is really foundational in the church's response to the Gnostic movement. But with the Nag Hammadi Library, for the first time, we have stuff from the Gnostics themselves, and not just from their enemies. Because I say, it's very hard to trust if somebody's in battle with somebody, that they're going to always be forward and frank about it. So for show and tell, Letter to Flora is the one you want to read. If you want to start something, go. Something attractive. But again, a lot of it's crazy. Just crazy. All right. Speaking of crazy, today the last lecture is going to be on apocalyptic. And it's a preparation. Well, it's a look back. So you need, this is when you need your synopsis. Get your synopsis and open it to Pericope 287. 287. So I'm going to give you a little lecture about apocalyptic Christianity. It will in part be a preparation for Revelation, which is next month. And then also look back, because we're going to look back at one chapter of the synoptics. So again, 287, it should say the eschatological discourse. That should be the title on the top. Okay? Not page. Pericope 287. In, in the blue book, page 254. Yeah. All right. So, all eyes up here now. Let your, let your books go. Let them be. Karen. Karen, up here. Let's let the books be, okay? We'll, we'll come back to them, but engage. Ready? Engage. Apocalyptic. Apocalypticism is another modern term for an ancient movement, okay? Movements don't always get to identify themselves or name themselves. But when scholars look back and they can see themes, they can see ideas that are in common, we can give them names. Apocalypsis is the name of the last book of the Bible. Uh, calypto, calypso is to open or to unveil. I'm sorry, or, or to veil, I'm sorry, it's to close. It's to veil. Apo is to un, so undo it. So apocalypto is to unveil. There's something that's out there but hidden. Let me Open the doors for you. Revelation, literally the word to reveal, is to open the curtains or open the doors on something that's been there but that you haven't seen. Apocalypticism is a name given to a theological movement in Judaism and Christianity that was very widespread between 200 B.C., and 200 AD, Christianity grows up against the backdrop of this movement. 
which flavors much of Judaism and much of Christianity. What I want to do is set up in this lecture, set up why do, what was this movement about, and what does this writings that came from it, what, what do they have in common? How, how can I, how should I expect they work? So that when you read Revelation, you are prepared. On a yellow page that I gave you, like this, I didn't give you, you took. I put it out there. This is the, this is the outline of a talk I gave. And it has some of the stuff that I'm going to want to refer back to you in um, upcoming uh, classes. But look at number one. So Revelation is, a, is one example of a whole collection of literature composed for those, between those 400 years. It has its own rules. It was not meant to frighten its readers. Apocalypticism was never meant to be a countdown to the end of the world. Okay? That's what you think it means. That's what many biblical readers expect it to be. That is not what it was ever attend intended to be. It was intending to be filled with hope in an age when things were coming apart. Things were, we realize we, well, in a sense, we're moving towards apocalyptic times in America. Now, hear me out here. I'm not saying that the road's going to blow up. But what I mean is, when human structures fail, you know, I mean, we think just pour more money, pour more education, pour more talk, it'll all work out. But when structures of a society or a culture fail, you look outside the culture for a rescue. Jewish people lived in a time they had lost their freedom as an independent nation at the end of the, or the beginning of the sixth century. And they were subject to the Persians for a while, the Babylonians for a while, then the Persians, then the Greeks. And it didn't get better, it got worse. Now, some of them did fine. There were Jews who kind of made peace with the culture, okay? They became, they became like the Persians. They became like, like the Greeks. You know, if you can't fight them, join them. They were the upper crust. So when we get to read, well, maybe next year, we'll read Daniel, which is the fourth year, we'll really go into it about Hellenism. Hellenism was this, the Greek culture, the world that brought you the, the Greek drama and, and uh, Greek science and the Parthenon kind of came in as an imperialistic way of thinking that kind of dominated the Eastern Roman Empire before Rome, okay? And it wasn't friendly always to local religion. And Judaism, two centuries before Jesus, was, oh, I'm sorry, Israel, the promised land, was ruled by Greek-speaking, the, the descendants of Alexander the Great's army, his generals. They brought in Greek ideas. They loved Greek, Greek learning. I mean, again, Greek learning's got lots going for it, huh? Some of the Jewish people really liked that and said, you know, our ways are so old-fashioned. Our religion is so a crock. You know, let's get with the times. Let's get with the people who are running the show. Let's get with the Greeks. So there was an element in, in Judaism, Jewish people, who aligned themselves with the Greek worldview. And at some point, there was a push and a shove. And rather than just inviting people to the Jewish, to do the Greek worldview, the Jews, the, the Hellenized Jews said, we're making everybody do it this way. And they began to impose Greek ideas on Judaism. And that led to a pushback from the people, the common people. And that led to the Maccabean revolt. Okay? If you're familiar with, with Hanukkah, Again, next year or the year after, we'll read all about this. That's the beginning of the apocalyptic era because the, those who are in charge of the world are not with God. They are, seem to be opposed to God. They seem to be persecute us. So, and, we, and our kings, we have no more kings anymore, and our upper class, they've sold out, 
and, and our religious leaders are not always what they should be. God, you need to break in. You need to come down now. You need to kick butts and take names. And the kind of literature that was produced to carry that message is what we mean by apocalypticism. Here's a definition on this yellow page is a definition of what apocalyptic literature looks like. A type of revelatory literature. That means it, it reveals something, huh? In a narrative framework, which means it's going to be story time. You like stories, okay? It's not going to be like Paul, not like letters. It's like the Gospels. It'll be narratives, huh? In which an otherworldly being, usually an angel, discloses details of a transcendent reality. That is, how things are with God to a human recipient. Okay? Just, just let it be. Just let it be. Just, just leave it be. Oh, during, yeah, now's not the time. Okay? So, again, it's a kind of literature in a narrative framework where the otherworldly being delivers a message of how things are on the other side to a human party. It can be temporal, which means it can disclose news of how God is acting in time, or it can be spatial, let's go on a trip to see the universe, or the sun, or the stars, or the planets. Now, that's a pretty heady, you know, university type definition, but it covers it. It covers this literature. Here's a second volume for show and tell. This is a collection, and just look at the table of contents inside the front cover. These are all writings that are apocalyptic. There are only two whole books of the Bible that are apocalyptic. Daniel in the Old Testament and Revelation in the New Testament. But there are a handful of other works that have bits and pieces of this. But there was a whole ton of other literature outside the Bible that's apocalyptic, okay? So for show and tell two, and I'll collect that one, take a look at this. Inside the front cover, um, anything in black is apocalyptic. This is a collection of literature from Judaism um, between 200 BC and about 500 AD. So the first thing you have to know is that Revelation is one out of a whole library of literature, okay? If you think it's the only one, well, then you'll say, well, it must be about the future. It's going to count down. The it's not the only one. It's part, it's from a whole outlook on life and that was written. And how is it, how is that hopeful? Because God controls history. In all apocalyptic literature, God is ultimately in control. Right now, it may not look that way, but be at peace. God is in control. It's not going to be easy. God's not going to wave a magic wand. There may be struggle. There may be hardship. There may be persecution. But in the end, God wins. And his transcendent vision will come to us. Okay? Tori, pick on Tori. Tori, Tori's father-in-law was buried yesterday, and she read from Revelation. And what it was about was heaven coming to earth. It's not us going to heaven. You'll see that. Revelation is not how we get to heaven. It's about how heaven comes to earth. Okay? So the first thing you have to do is flush your minds. Because you have picked up crap from TV evangelists, from your college roommate Bible study, from, I mean, just, it's great stuff, but it's not what you think it is. People who don't know the, the context kind of make it into a almanac, you know, 12 days to go, you know, uh, T minus, you know. No, that's not generally what it's about at all. So that definition again, Remember, it's a, it's a kind of revelatory. It, you know, next year we're going to deal with the prophets. The prophets are also doing revelatory literature. They're going to reveal God's plan. 
Apocalypticism takes over when prophecy dies out. Do you see the connection? The prophets are talking for God. Here's what God wants the world to be. But as prophecy dies out, what takes its place is this kind of literature. All right? All right. So, again, that definition, what kind of writing is it? It is revelatory literature with a narrative framework. It's content. It's a message about an end time rescue of some kind from the supernatural world. Its function, it's meant to the interpret present troubles in light of that supernatural world. What did it's Nietzsche, I think you said it. Given a why, you can, you can accept almost any what. That is, you know, you've got cancer, you've got, but if you have hope in a, in a bigger picture, then the troubles of today are put in context. That's how apocalyptic works. It's hopeful literature. Not hopeful for everybody, <laughs> because there are people who are on the other side. Huh? But it's hopeful for the people who produce it and those who read it. Remember I told you, some of the upper class in Judaism align themselves with Hellenism. They're, they're, they don't read this stuff. In fact, you know what? People in charge never read this stuff. Why not? Because they like the way things are. People who are in charge like the way it is. They change it themselves if they, if they didn't like it. Huh? So people, upper class, powerful people, uh, hierarchical people don't read apocalyptic literature. It's people who find that things are out of joint, that things need to change, who look to God to step in with his vision to make it change. Okay? With me so far? All right. So let me just, I was just doing that all off top, off top of my head here. Let's look at my notes here. Taken together, it seems to reflect a worldview which was new and distinctive when it first emerged in Judaism during the Hellenistic period. By Hellenism, I mean the centuries after Alexander the Great, before the Romans came on the scene. Concern for judgment beyond death. That should say that. The idea of life beyond death is born in this literature. You've heard me last year say Ain't the Old Testament doesn't have a belief in resurrection. The idea of resurrection is born during this apocalyptic period. It's, it's hopeful. Get it? See? What, what if I get the shape? Remember, remember the, the, the rule, um, the law of retribution? What's the law of retribution? You get, you get what you deserve. Karma. Karma, in a sense. Huh? The Old Testament, the oldest part of it, is built on the law of retribution. So what do people think if everything they do, that the best people, the people who are, who are most faithful to the tradition, most faithful, when they get the shaft, they think, what did we do wrong? If God, if God rewards those who are just, see, it's, it's in that tension, it's in that tension that, that, that Judaism began to think, surely God has more in mind for us. We see a lot of good people getting the shaft. God, there, you must surely have a different, the law of retribution must not be your only plan. Ah, life that continues, life beyond this life, is the response. Okay, we're gonna deal more with that, not so much this year, but when we get to Daniel, okay? So, so, the birth of, of the idea of resurrection comes out of this. So don't think this is just, this is just crazy talk. It's not crazy talk. It's, it's, it's a wonderful world. Now again, don't think of apocalypse, all the, book, the works of those books written by the same people. A lot of different kinds of books, a lot of different, but they're all saying the same thing. The world is out of joint. God, we need you to break in. We have a vision of how it's going to happen. Or we get a message from you that it's going to happen. And therefore, we can find confidence to remain faithful. It's not generally a literature that says, rise up in arms, you know. 
you know, uh, the, the, the wicked that would swallow the world, get rid of your chains, revolt, burn down the, the palace of the king. No, no, no. It's not inciting riots. It's encouraging the believer to remain true, that God controls history. I said, here's just three points, and then we'll do some reading if you've got questions. It is generally assumed that apocalypticism arises from an experience of alienation and crisis. Persecution, culture shock, social powerlessness. When things aren't working like they're supposed to work. That's the sociological background. Second, a hope engendered by looking from the distressful present to the heavenly world and to the future world is what the literature is trying to give us. Third, not simply as a flight from reality, though it can be for some people, not a call to arms to burn down the city, though people have used it that way, but rather a way of coping with reality by providing a meaningful framework within which we human beings can hold on to the truth, can make decisions, and take action. It is a hopeful literature. I'll catch my breath. Who's got a question? Yes, John. So you said that the birth of the resurrection came from apocalypse? The idea of, of resurrection in Judaism grew up in this context. In Judaism. Now that's two centuries before Jesus. Again, I think we talk. You know, we see that in the Gospels. You know, there's the Pharisees. They believe in resurrection. The Sadducees don't. Remember that? Sadducees is going to get... So in Judaism, there were Jews who believed in resurrection, and there were those who didn't. Well, those... The Pharisees were a party that did believe in resurrection. They got this idea from this period. This, this, that idea, that Judaism finally threw away the law of retribution and said, you know, this isn't working. This is not, this is not how it seems God works. And so they, they left that, I mean, they, it's still in the Bible, but the idea that everybody gets what they deserve on this, on this earth, do you really believe that? Uh, I don't think so. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that when we read liter about wisdom literature. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. So you gotta separate those ideas. Yeah, but then Jesus left, did he also warned us all kinds of things that will happen before his coming? We're gonna read that. Just so yeah. it's not waiting for Jesus even Some of it is, but most of it's not. Okay. Again, so I, I wanna put it in a bigger context. So the bigger context is world's not going well. What do we hope in as people of faith? Well, God's judgment, ultimately, but there's, there's things before that. Yes, Jim. Um, we often talk about prophets, and sometimes we talk about seers. Is there a definition of difference between them? Th there is. Again, next year, we'll, really, we'll spend time on that. A seer is somebody who has visions, who has a vision. A prophet is someone who speaks for God. So there are different aspects that can be combined in the same individual, or there might be different individuals. People who have visions and just report what they see. And those who say, thus says the Lord. God says, no more black and white shirts. Get rid of them. I mean, that's, you know, that's a statement. Huh? So a seer is one who sees visions. A prophet, and so prophets do have visions. I mean, they, so prophets are sometimes addressed as seers. But not, they're not identical, always. Okay. I, I, I hope you're getting this. I, we've had three lessons in a row that have gone, <laughs> new stuff. Um, so there are three parts. <laughs> One is that it, it comes out of alienation and crisis. Yes. Second, the hope of looking for, from a difficult present circumstance and having a need to make it a better world. And the, third, the third one is... Again, not simply as a, this literature is not simply a flight from reality, nor is it a, a called revolution. Though again, in both cases, there are people who have done that with this literature. 
but it's really meant to be a way of coping with reality by providing a meaningful framework within which a community of faith can make decisions and take action. How do we live under this current situation? When you prepare, for, when you prepare next time for Revelation, I think you'll find in the, um, what's the book that you're reading? Um, so the Kester, Kester. Kester is going to put the Re book of Revelation in a historical context. What was going on in the church in the first century? What was going on was the beginning of the rise of persecution, social persecution. We don't like you because you're Christian. We're not going to shop at your store because you're a Christian. We're not going to invite you to our daughter's wedding because you're a Christian. Because the assumption was is that because Christians would not worship the empire, that they were undercutting the empire. The Roman, Romans were really quite gracious and generous about religion. As long as you did not deny their beliefs, they wouldn't deny your beliefs. But if you denied their beliefs, they had a problem with that. Because the Romans had a sense that the, sa the sacrifices made to the Roman gods, made to the city of Rome itself, is what kept the empire going. It's like if we had a 4th of July, well, here it is. It's like people who kneel at the singing of the national anthem. Doesn't that just irritate us, some of us? Huh? Because we associate that song with our country, its heritage. Well. The Romans saw the Christians somewhat like that because they would not participate in Roman civil religion. They wouldn't offer sacrifice. They wouldn't say, Tiberius is a god. They wouldn't say that. And that made the Romans uncomfortable. It meant the Romans were afraid the gods are going to be honked off at us because these people aren't participating in the worship. So there are social reasons. There are political reasons, but the, the tension against Christians began to rise. That's the background against which John the seer has his visions. Peter. How come the Romans made such a big exception for the Jews? <laughs> Good point. The Jews had an exception because they had, Rome and, and the Israel had had associations long before Rome had taken possession of that part of the empire. And again, Romans loved old things. They loved old things. And this is an old religion. I mean, this is older than, than Roman religion. So they had to respect it. And the Jews made a deal. We will offer sacrifices every day for the emperor and the empire. Until what happened? Until 70, then, it was, then the deal was off. Okay? <laughs> the deal was off. But you're right. Julius Caesar particularly had a fondness for Jews. He was raised with some Jewish exiles who, I mean, Jewish king's children were sent to Rome to be um, hostages, you know, for agreements. And he got to know them and he found them fascinating. So Julius Caesar in particular was very welcoming, but there was still a lot of anti Semitism within Judaism in general. Okay. All right. <laughs> So, 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 so what we've done is we've looked at this literature and tried to glump it together, apocalypticism, okay? And again, the word just simply means to unveil or reveal. It means it reveals what God is up to. What does God want for us? And think of it as the consequence or the sequel to the prophets. Who speaks for God? These writings speak for God. But God doesn't say, no one says, thus says God, but let me tell you a story. And the story reveals what God is about. Now, we're going to take um, a little sidebar to read this. So get your, get your um, another big word, eschatological. Gosh, you've got to hate biblical people. They make up these words. Eschaton means last or final. The eschatological discourse is Jesus' speech about the final things, about final things. 
Um, you also, I gave you a handout, I think, it's pink. Looks like this. I want to show you the seeds of apocalypticism. You see those, those big, those texts um, that are Amos, Isaiah, Psalms. Um, let me just point out, um, I lost something here. Yeah, I can get that one out. Just, here are the, you know, I, I use the image of a coloring box. When I was a kid, when you went to grade school, you had to bring colors to school, grade school, you know, and, you know, at, at least a 12 pack. And we were always envious of the kids whose parents got them the 36, and then the big box, 72, with us. Okay. So the, the writing, the apocalyptic writing, uses the coloring box of the prophets. Revelation, there are 500 allusions to the Old Testament. There's no direct quotes from the Old Testament. No words that say, as Isaiah says, or as Daniel says, but there are 500 allusions where John the seer mentions something that echoes what was said in the Old Testament prophets. And I'm going to give you some examples. Well, just some taste here. So Amos. Amos is eight centuries before Jesus. Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord... In all the squares there shall be wailing. In all the streets they shall say, Alas, alas. They shall call the farmers to mourning and to wailing those who are skilled in lamentation. In all vineyards there shall be wailing. For I will pass through the midst of you, says the Lord. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. Now, Amos, we're going to find out next year, is... The, is, a, is a man most concerned with the social work of how the, how the society works. And it's going to sound very familiar. The rich are eating the poor. The rich are selling them for, for uh, leftovers. The rich get to get, the, the, the courts always give the rich the verdict the rich want because they're buying. It's going to sound very, very contemporary. Amos' response to that is, God is going to act. It's the day of the Lord. Evidently, some of Amos' contemporaries thought that when God acted, he was going to be in their behalf. Again, make it America. You know, America, you know, God's on our side sort of thing. Who's to say God's on our side? Huh? Maybe our parents' side, but who's to say that God is on our side? When we kind of, you know, we, when we say and sing things like that, that, you know, how do, is God really proud of what America is doing? Similarly, Amos was warning his contemporaries, God, Yahweh is not really happy with how things are going. So don't be looking for the day of the Lord. Because the day of the Lord means God is taking names and kicking butts. There will be judgment. Okay? Isaiah takes that idea of the day. Isaiah is like a century later. Wail. For the day of the Lord is near, as destruction from the Almighty it will come. Uh, verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the earth a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. Verse 11, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pride of the arrogant and lay low the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make men more rare than fine gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Now again, you're running ahead of me and saying, oh yeah, God's going to be upset at the end of time. Isaiah is not thinking about the end of time. Isaiah is thinking about something that's going to happen in his time. Okay? He was, now, we may read it and think about the end of time, but he was not. He just got, if God finally wakes up and steps into the world, there's going to be a major realignment of things here. Huh? And, and this is the, the poetic language that prophets, you know, again, this is not apocalyptic yet. Yet. 
But this is going to be the, the seed of that kind of writing. And then Psalm 18, which is a psalm I love, 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 love. But here is another example of the, 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 the literature that came before apocalyptic. Um, the, the, pro, the, pro, the psalmist is upset. Something is terrible has happened. And then he calls out to God, and God answers his prayer. Again, he's not talking about the end of time. He's talking about his problem. He's got a problem right now, and God answered. Look to see how he describes it. Verse 4. The cords of death encompass me. The torrents of perdition assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. He's in a bad way, huh? In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. And my cry to him reached his ears. I kind of teased earlier, God's going to wake up. Well, they kind of saw it that way, that God has been really too patient. And finally, God's going to act. So God hears. Verse 7, Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering around him, his canopy thick clouds dark with water. Out of the brightness before him there broke through his clouds hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens. The Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the, of the world were laid bare. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. 25,000 brownie points. At the end there, what is the psalmist referencing? What is he? Now, this, the psalmist has got a problem. And he says, God heard my problem. But what does he liken it to? What does the psalmist liken God's response to? Earthquake. Earthquake? Yeah, but go beyond that at the end. Look at the end. Go beyond that. Something that a Jew would recognize. Exodus! The Exodus! Yes! Yes, exactly! The Exodus event is the primordial example of God waking up, coming down on our enemies, setting us free, setting things upside down. But he's really praying about his own problem. But he's saying, because what God is going to do for me, what God did for our ancestors in Moses' day. So Judaism has always prayed for God to continue that work that he did in the Exodus. So you're going to find, when we read Psalms next year, how many times prayers reference their problems to the Exodus. That is, God, we need you to do again what you did in the past. Things are not right now. We need your help. Anytime you and I pray, we're asking God to step into history, aren't we? And when God steps into history, things are going to get, if they're unjust, they're going to be rearranged. Okay? So you can see this is kind of the beginning of what will grow when, when prophecy dies then apocalypticism is going to take over and use the same kind of confidence in God to break in. All right. Now, let's look at the synopsis. I mean, again, one more thing. Because, again, how is Jesus apocalyptic? How is Jesus apocalyptic? Huh? How are things in the world? Do away with the law, with, with bad religion, with the, with the, the high priest, huh? with, 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 uh, with the rich getting rich, you know, the, the, the things of, of Jesus' new set of, of, of vision for uh, not, you know, power, pleasure, um, money, uh, honor, but poor in spirit, 
when they person, I mean, his, he had a different vision. So Jesus' coming into the world is an apocalyptic thing. Remember Mary's song, Magnificat. God's going to bring down the mighty and raise up the lowly. You know, the hungry he will fill with good things. The rich is underway empty. There are things in our society that are wrong. And Jesus has stepped in as God's agent. At the end of Jesus' public ministry, he's in Jerusalem. And the disciples are, now we have three columns here. So I'm going to go back and forth from column to column. Again, this sheet have, you know, sticking outside the top of, the, of, the, of, your, of your synopsis, okay? Because there are, it says four themes, there should be five themes. I don't know why I couldn't type correctly. Um, anyway, read Mark. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Verse 3. As he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? What will be the sign when these things are all to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them. Okay, so Jesus has said, now, the temple in Jerusalem was like the mall in Washington, D.C. It was a work of wonderful architecture. They spent, Herod and his successors spent 50 years of taxes making it just a wonder of the world. And what does Jesus say? It's all going to come down. All going to be come down. Not one stone left for another. And that got the disciples' attention. When is this going to happen? We all love secrets, don't we? Tell us, what's it going to happen? <laughs> Jesus isn't going to answer that question. But what he does is these themes. So you're going to see on the upper pink sheet, the destruction of Jerusalem. This, we, we got the introduction. Skip to verse 14. Turn the page. Pericope 290. Okay, so this is the continuation of that theme. When you see the desolating sacrilege set up where it ought not be, parentheses, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything away. Let him who is in the field not turn back to take his mantle. Alas, for those who are with child and for those who suck, who give suck in those days, Pray that it may not happen in winter, for in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation which God created until now, and there will never will be. And if the Lord had not shortened the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Now, many people just come to this text and assume Jesus is talking about the end of the world. He's not. He's talking about the end of Jerusalem. Remember what happened in the year 70? The, right, the Jews revolted in 66. It took the Romans a couple years to get their act together. Finally, in 70, they captured the temple and they destroyed, they dismantled it. Okay? That's what Jesus is talking about. Contrair, com, com, uh, compared to what Luke and Matthew have, it becomes clearer. Look at the Lucan column, Luke 21, 20. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are inside the city depart. Let not those who are out in the country enter it, for these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. If the world is the point, if the world coming to an end is the point of it, then there's nowhere to go, is there? Really, huh? huh? So he's not talking about the end of the world. He's talking about the end of the world for Jerusalem. <laughs> He's talking about the end. Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem. And that from, for us, that's in the past. Huh? Look at verse 24 of the Lucan column. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations. And Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now again, from Jesus' point of view, this is the future. For our point of view... It's the past. Okay? You get that? So when we read this 
chapter, we got to break it up because some of it's in the past. Some of it is the future, but some of it's the past. And that's the first piece, the destruction of Jerusalem. Second theme, Jesus warns not to be deceived or alarmed. Go to verse 5 of the Markan column, back on Pericope 288. So they ask him, when is this going to happen? Verse 5, Jesus began to say, Take heed that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. Again, people will say, oh, it's the end of the world, right? No. Jesus is saying, don't get excited. There will always be earthquakes. There will always be war. That does not mean the end. Yet, it's the birth pains. It's the beginning. Okay? I hear, you know, when we have, like, there's an earthquake now at St. Victor. Oh, my God, the sky's falling. Well, it might be the end, but I would bet you it's not. Because people have bet for hundreds of years. This is it. This is it. And it wasn't, was it? <laughs> Jesus is saying, put out the fire. Don't get on the house top and get all excited. Because it's, it's delicate, it's difficult to know. You can't judge. You don't know. In the end, he's going to say, even I don't know. So he is trying to tamp down. The, can you imagine the excitement in the Jewish community as the Romans began to circle around Jerusalem? The Jews who had leadership had destroyed Christ. They're going to get theirs now. Maybe this is the end. Okay? But Jesus left the disciples' word saying, Be calm. Do not get in a lather. Be careful. Don't be deceived. Look at verse 9. Pretty 29. Take heed to yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear testimony before them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. When they bring you to trial to deliver you up, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will deliver up brother to death, and the father his child. And children will be rise against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. So, Father Mark, is this the end time? No. This is every time. Jesus is telling us this is what it's going to be like from now until the end. If you, if you, if you think that Christians aren't being persecuted right now, you must should listen to the news more. Go back and rewrite the story of the Pope in Iraq. Huh? Um, Christians have always faced opposition. This is not just some prediction of some day. This is what the church will need to be about all the time. Okay? So Jesus is leaving now, but he wants to give his disciples some message for how to go on in the future. What has he told them so far? The temple's going to go away. Don't be overly trippy and, and, and overly anxious at a time. There, there will always be persecution. Next, look out for the fox inside the hen house. Verses 21 and 22. Pericope 290. Oops, 291. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. Okay? False Christs, false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect chosen. Take heed, I have told you all things beforehand. So he's warning us that in the life of the church, there will always be those who say, I am the one, I know the way, follow me. 
Don't believe them, Jesus said. See, if anything to this point, Jesus is ramping down expectations of the end of time. Now again, I know preachers who think, oh, this is all about the end of time. No, it's really quite the opposite. He's ramping down expectations. And how long has it been? Ah, almost 2,000 years. I guess we should have listened to him. Okay? When you're in Revelation, I mean, you know, again, Castor will help you. People have predicted the end of the world a bazillion times. And, and if they're right, that book is written for only one generation, the generation that's going to that's be at the end. Uh, well, then the people who read it so far have wasted their time. Okay, one last bit. Because Jesus does talk about the end. 24 to 27. Pericope 292. In those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give light, the stars will be falling from heaven. This is typical apocalyptic literature. This is the stuff that you see in Isaiah and Amos. God is going to act. The powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. And then he talks about the fig tree. Look at verse 32. But of that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Even Christ doesn't know, he says. How do you suppose John the Evangelist thought about that one? So then the final conclusion is, stay awake then. Always be on guard. Always be ready. Always be ready to live today out of the vision of Christ for the future. Okay? Turn it off. Please.